splendor of a king, of the majesty and all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, it trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and oh, see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning in the end, beginning in the end. The God that free in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the see all of you here this morning. If you are visiting with us, welcome. We are glad that you are here. We would ask that you please fill out one of the attendance cards and you can hand it to one of the people as you leave. We'd love to have a record of your visit. Today is also our family Sunday, so we also invite you to stay and have a meal together as we will get to fellowship with a meal together this afternoon. All of y'all that have logged online, welcome. We are glad that you're online also. We're going to be uh, singing about laboring in the vineyard and working and all that. Number 611, please. 611. <clears throat> Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep end, Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee, promise thee, but that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with. Rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and God. He is the light, in him is no darkness ever and walking so close to his side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding. Glory divine, hallelujah. I am rejoicing, singing his praises. Jesus is mine in the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises. Gladly I walk. Sunlight, the sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah! I am rejoicing, singing His praises. Jesus is mine. Number seven hundred nineteen, please seven one nine. After we sing this song, we let it over for 719. Ladies. <laughs> Angry words, oh, let them Let 
Father, that you continue to be with them. We ask that you continue to keep them within, within the hall of your hand to wrap your love around them. We're thankful, dear Heavenly Father, for this country, the freedoms we have. And we know, dear Heavenly Father, that it comes with a price, and we ask that you be with those that serve in the military and those that are first responders, that you continue to be with them and protect them. We're so mindful, dear Heavenly Father, of this hurricane that is pressing upon Florida. We know, dear Heavenly Father, that there will be some destruction and hopefully not loss of life. But we, we know, dear Heavenly Father, if we put our trust in you, that things will work out. But help us, dear Heavenly Father, to help those that are in the path. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for this congregation and the unity and the love we have for one another and for you. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to continue to be unified. Help us to always trust in you and to be able to spread your word. 
We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for this congregation, the elders and the deacons. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you continue to be with them and help us, dear Heavenly Father, to, to be a congregation that is loving to one another in this community. We're mindful, dear Heavenly Father, of the youth group and those within this congregation that are in Tampa, and we ask that you be with them in the travels and during their time there and their travels back. We're also mindful, dear Heavenly Father, of all the activities within this congregation that, that reach out to this community and support this community, and we thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for all the hands that, that take place in doing these great works. We're so mindful, dear Heavenly Father, of your Son who came to this earth, lived a perfect life, and gave us an example of how to live. And then knowing that he would die a cruel death for our sins. And we ask, dear Heavenly Father, as we this morning take the communion, that we're mindful of the price that was paid for our soul. Again, we ask that you be with us during this hour. Help us to always do the things that are in accordance with your will. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. To help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, sing now how deep the Father's love is not in your books to be able to scream, okay? <laughs> How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to Why so? 
which is the only place. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time we have together around this table. We thank you for this bread that represents the body of Jesus as he hung on that cross for our sins. Help us to focus on Jesus, focus on his sacrifice, remember his body and the pain and humiliation he suffered for our sins. Help us to take this bread in a pleasing way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bell me again. Our Father in heaven, we thank you also for the fruit of the vine that represents the precious blood that Jesus shed on the cross. Please be with us now to take it, that we do so in a manner pleasing in your sight, remembering that blood, the blood that cleanses us of all our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.
This concludes the Lord's Supper. We have the opportunity to give. There's an online portal giving, for giving, and there's a box in the uh, foyer and a tray in the back that you'd like to give on your way out. Could you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for all the many gifts you give to us, both physical and spiritual. We pray that you continue to bless us, guide us in the use of the things that you give us, help us to be good stewards of all the blessings you give to us. <coughs> help us to use these things to help other folks and to spread the word. We pray that you be with the elders as they have oversight of this money, that they would use it in a manner pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you are following in my song books, there's an invitation song will be number 934, 934. You can mark that. That'll be our song of encouragement at the proper time. Before our lesson of the hour, we'll sing number 23. Number 23, very challenging song this morning. One we haven't sang in quite some time. So, If you have a child that's between the ages of 2 and 5 and you are interested in the child to go to a class while the lesson is being presented here in the auditorium, if you make your way out through the back and down the hallway, all the way at the end of the hallway in the last classroom on the right, there'll be someone there to assist you. Also at the end of the hallway, uh, on down the stairs in the annex part of the, our uh, building, we do have a Spanish-speaking service that will be singing together and bringing the message in Spanish, and you can take a part of that also. Number 23, all the way able to please stand. <coughs> There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tends its skies with empty youth and when the worlds with his great mind. There is a God. There is a God. He is a God. In him we live and we survive from the chapter of Matthew. It's the parable of the workers in the vineyard. It's familiar to all of us. And a wise preacher I once knew says familiar scripture needs to be studied more carefully. It reads like this. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into the vineyard. 
And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Again he went out in the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard called to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they were supposed they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I'm not I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not receive with me for denarius? And take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give you wish to give this last man the same as to you. It is not lawful for me to do what I is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because of I am good? So the last will be first. And first will be last, for many are called, but few are chosen. Well, good morning again. Good morning. Parables of Jesus, heavenly messages written for us to read this side of eternity in the temporal world that we live. Blessed that these words are actually the words of Jesus to teach us a valuable lesson as all the parables are. So before we delve into this and as Jerry said, um, study it closely, I want to remind you that The Gospel of Matthew has several parables. One of the parables that we looked at back in February as part of our theme that we're focusing on, strengthening our spiritual walk, dealt with the unforgiving or unmerciful servant. And what we learned from that was that an unforgiving spirit is not an appropriate behavior in the kingdom of God. In a similar manner that Jesus would teach there in Matthew 18, he teaches now here in chapter 20. And I want you to notice a couple of things that are in the reading that was before us. There's a landowner. He's got a vineyard. He needs it harvested. So the grapes are ready. He hires an initial group. He promises them a day's wage, a denarius. Then as the day goes on, in the third, the sixth, and the ninth hour, he is going to go back out, and he's going to find individuals that are idle. They're doing nothing, standing in the marketplace. And he says, go into the vineyard and labor and harvest for me, and I will make it right. At the conclusion of the reading, we notice that a denarius is given to them all. As promised, that which was agreed upon was received by all. The question was asked to the group that was idle still at the end of the day. Why are you still idle? Why are you doing nothing? Because nobody's hired me. 
They had been there when the invitation was made by the landowner, come and work for me. But idleness had held some of them back. They had not responded. And I ask you this morning as we focus on the content of this lesson, are you ready to respond when called by the Lord? Because as the slide shows, we need to do that. By the way, these slides were made up for me for this lesson by Kyler Chapelin, another one of the youth that is participating in year-round PowerPoint as part of our Lads to Leaders and Leaderette training. They are learning the skill of PowerPoint. Have you ever done a PowerPoint? It's not as easy as you might think. I remember when I first came here, I was the guy that got up and preached a sermon. You didn't have it in your bulletin. You didn't have an outline. You didn't have an article. You didn't have a PowerPoint. There was just, all you had was listening to me. Tommy says, I want you to do PowerPoint. And I'm going, what is that? <laughs> and so I had to learn. Boy, if y'all remember any of those early on PowerPoints of mine, We've got to commend these kids for their efforts. Mine were basic blue backgrounds with bright yellow letters. Any of y'all remember how horrible that was? I do. But these children are making an effort. They did not stay idle. They were willing to labor. So this morning as we look at this parable, let me use some of the examples that we have in the context. The context is always important. The setting, if you will. Maybe you don't understand the word context, but setting might be easier for you to understand. For us to understand the context and setting of this particular parable, we need to back up a little bit. We need to understand the conversation that was started with the young, rich ruler. You, you remember the, the account. Jesus has this young rich ruler come to him. This is all covered in Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22. And he basically asked Jesus this question. Good rabbi, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? Actually, what he said was, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus responds to him and basically says to him after he corrects him that no one on earth is good but God alone in the universe. And so he says to them, to this young man, you need to keep the Ten Commandments. And he starts saying some of them. You shall not murder or shall not commit adultery, shall not steal, shall not bear false witness, shall honor your father and your mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man says, I've been doing all that stuff since I was a kid. And Jesus said, well, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to be in the presence of Jehovah God, if you want to have eternal life, I want you to go and sell everything you have. I want you to give it to the poor. And I want you to come follow me. I want you to understand that the context here, the setting, is here an example that Jesus gives of how many distractions keep us from doing kingdom work. Laboring in the vineyard why were they idle? Were they wanting someone to force them into the harvest? What was their reasoning? Did they want to work? The rich young ruler, he appears to want to be saved. But when it comes right down to it, he realizes, man, I've got a lot of stuff. Man, I can't give up my stuff. I won't have anything left if I come follow you and I've sold everything. 
I don't want to be a pauper. I like my stuff. I like my money. I like my status. I like my lifestyle. I like being worldly, in other words. Well, in the same chapter, chapter 19, picking up at verse 23 through verse 26, then we begin to see the discussion that Jesus starts having with His disciples. And they're really concerned because, you see, they recognize that if He's got to give up everything and He's got... And it is still possible, but He's got to give up everything that He can be in eternity. What are we going to get? Notice the text. Assuredly I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Jesus used this opportunity, the rich young ruler, to teach a heavenly message to the disciples. And to you and I this morning, so that we might understand how difficult it is for those who have a lot of stuff and a lot of money and a great lifestyle have trouble letting go of it to come follow Jesus. So right in the midst of this then, verse 27 of chapter 19, Peter, we love Peter, don't we? He's just like us. He asked a question. Listen to his question. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So, what is the really essence of this question? Is he expecting some kind of special status in the kingdom? Do some of us ever think that way? Do we ever allow ourselves to think commercially? Well, I labored a lot, so I must get a lot. Or like a mercenary. I'll do this if you pay me that. The attitude that he was on the borderline of heaven, which was not something to have in the kingdom, then was a reality. And unlike the young man, Peter and other and the other disciples had accepted to just come follow Jesus. You remember the seaside situation. Jesus is walking along. There's Peter, James, and John. They're with their dad. And he looks at him and says, come, follow me. Some versions say, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Rather than trying to work all day and maybe catch a few fish, I'm going to teach you about how important it is to catch souls for God above. Come and labor with me. Don't be idle anymore. Come and labor with me. You're a Jew. You should know this is important. Come follow me. It appears Peter was wanting to know if the rich man could barely be saved and these guys had given up everything and they were already poor, very poor, what was going to be their reward? Was there some kind of personal profit involved? Sometimes we think, well, if I do this, I'm going to get this. If I become a Christian, I don't have any more problems. Life is going to be a bliss. I will tell you this morning, that is just not true. If you want to know the real truth, we have to count the cost. Because as soon as we say, Jesus, I give up all of it. 
I'm willing to forsake all of it. I'm ready to follow you. Satan's going to say, target that boy. Target that girl. We need to break them. And here comes life's troubles. Jesus has given a lesson here in the context, the setting, that we need to be careful not to be motivated solely by a desire for personal gain. So notice what Jesus says. This is on the slide. Assuredly I say to you, beginning in verse 28, Assuredly I say to you, that in the regeneration, Jesus has come, the dead in Christ have risen, the living in Christ have gone up, everyone else has gone, we've all stood before the throne, we've given an account for our lives, it's going to happen. In the regeneration, He says, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory, you who have followed Me will also, and He's talking to these disciples, you will be sitting on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm going to talk about that. And everyone who has left houses and brothers and sisters and father and mother or wife or children or lands for thy name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are, listen to it, first are going to be last. And the last will be first. Notice a couple of things here before we move on. There are two specific things that Jesus says here. There is, first of all, an assurance. The apostles, Matthew 9, 19 and verse 28, they are going to be looking over Spiritual Israel, which is the church. Jesus came to establish the kingdom. Remember His prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The church is the kingdom. They're going to be over that. Romans 9 and verse 6. Didn't add it to your notes. Galatians 3 and verse 29. Didn't add it to your notes. And he tells them, this is on the slide, book of Matthew chapter 16 verse 19. When they bind, it will be bound not only on earth, but also in heaven. If they loose here on earth, it will be loosed in heaven. They will have responsibility over their examples and their life, and the lives of others even unto eternity. In Matthew 25 and verse 31, a special role following the return of Christ when He comes, they will be there too with the heavenly host. But I want you to notice that He also talks to the disciples, not just the apostles. He says, in this life, a hundredfold shall be yours if you follow me. Here's how I would say that to you. You can't fathom what God has in store for you. It may not be riches of this world, but it's unfathomable. In the age to come, the everlasting life, Mark 10, 29 and 30, there will be eternal satisfaction. It's no longer about what I can get and what I can have and how big my retirement accounts are or what I have in the bank. The temporal things of this world that so strongly tempt to us. Those who give up all to receive more than enough they will lack nothing. But in that section there where Jesus is replying to the disciples, these are men that are going to become the apostles, 
He gives a warning and it's ours too. Look at verse 30. But many who are first will be last and the last first. You might call this upside down. <clears throat> Jesus turned the world upside down. Values of things are upside down. If the church could grasp a hold of this, we would be looked at by the world as upside down in our thinking. If you can think of someone who has been successful, how many of them have been humble? How many of them have been self-effacing? How many of them have been gentle? Not many. Most are aggressive and overbearing. And so Jesus speaks here about eternal rewards. We need to think of eternal rewards, not temporary benefits. Matthew 6 and verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all that will satisfy you. All these things that would satisfy you in the flesh, all that you need, you will receive and be satisfied in the kingdom. Where's your focus? The warning? The warning was to the rich young ruler. The warning is now here in the parable before us. <clears throat> it was a before and an after in the context. And so in the remaining time, notice what this parable is teaching. I'm going to summarize real quick. Just for your benefit, we've got a landowner. He hires people. They come to work for him. Verse 1 and 2. He goes out the third, the ninth, the sixth hour. Verse 3 and 7. He hires more. At the end of the day, did you notice it said the eleventh hour? That means from sun up to sun down, these people worked. He had promised them, what was it again? A denarius, one day's wage. Those who came early get one day's wage. Those who came late get one day's wage. That was what was promised. And so as we look at this then, then they grumble and they complain, well, wait a minute, I worked more so I should get more. That's a commercial thinking. My my labor should be commensurate, or my pay should be commensurate with the labor that I give. I'm educated after all, and I, 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 I. And we miss the fact that God is using Jesus to teach them I will fulfill my promise that you will receive what I have promised if you come and follow me. Next we see the parable and the message within it. The parable is a response to a question. You remember Peter's question, verse 27? Jesus says, it's not about necessarily you working long or you working short. You agreed to work. You agreed to come into the harvest. You remember Jesus said in another place, the fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers, the harvesters, are few. You know why? Because they're all standing around idle. And they're waiting to find out if they're going to get something if they give something. Jesus gave it all! Lifeblood, flesh between heaven and earth. The song we sang said, My sins were upon him. They held him to the cross, the weight of which bore down on his shoulders as he's hailed to that tree. Jesus gave it all. And so, the landowner is Jesus. 
The first called were the apostles. The rest are like you and I. They come at different hours in life. Some of us are going to labor for many years. Some of us are going to labor short periods of time. But here's the message. We all get the same promise that Jesus saves us and we will be with Him in eternity. Everyone receives. Did you not agree with me? So when we decide, I'm dead to self. Man, self has got to die. I've got to stop trying to rule the world through me. I can't fix anybody. I can't change anybody. I need to just yield to Jesus. And when we do that, and we're willing to stop being idle and become a worker, a laborer in the harvest, part of the kingdom, we make an agreement with the Lord. You're the only one that can save me. I believe in you. I'm going to stop trying to be the center of my universe. I'm going to follow you. I want to be cleansed. I want to be free of this burden of all my sins. Of trying to do it all myself. After all, I'm so deserving. I'm a, I've lost that thought. And we're baptized. We're buried into Jesus as so well beautifully described. If you're missing Wednesday night class, you need to be there. Looking at moments with Jesus. Little things can mean a lot in the way we see Jesus. So none of us has the right to question the generosity of the Lord. From our text it says, Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? The, late, the landowner says, Is it is your eye evil because I am good? Friends, we've got to stop thinking about what's in it for me. On the screen, hopefully. Matthew 20 and verse 7. When Jesus, when asked by Jesus to be standing by idle, why are you here idle? Why are you doing nothing? They said to him, because no one has hired us. You've heard the message. I was here this morning. Unless you slept in and you really didn't want to work. You stayed up too late and you had to sleep in because you didn't want to work. Where are your priorities? You see, that's what's being said there. Because no one hired us, Jesus said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. Notice what is said to those who remain in a condition though of rejection. I don't want to work. Acts 13 and verse 46 reminds us the judge, they will be judged themselves unworthy of everlasting life. In Romans 2 verses 4 through 11, we learn they are storing up for themselves wrath for the day of wrath. There is a day of regeneration coming. Jesus is coming. Are we standing around idle? Are we still waiting? Or have we decided to follow Jesus? And so from workers, workless to workers, grace is for all. And Jesus repeated a principle that is recorded in Matthew 19 verse 30 as well as Matthew 20 and verse 16. And that is, the last will be first and the first will be last. Doesn't matter. Whether you come early or you've waited to today and it's been a while. God's still ready right now. Hello? Are you letting him in? Are you ready to stop being idle? I'm outside. I want you for the harvest. Will you come outside and come with me? Come with me. 
I'll change your world. Stop being like the world. Come outside and be with me. And I will make you fishers of men. We have kingdom work. Can I, will you please come outside? How will we answer Jesus? Christ rejects the widely accepted notion, first come, first served. God isn't impressed with our achievements. Not a single one of them. We might be, others might be, but He's not. God rejects our comparisons. I don't want to be like anybody. I just want to be what God wants me to be. And when we stop trying to appease or be like other people and just want to be like Jesus, friends, we're li our lives are going to change. There's going to be transformation. Amen. And God will reward us in His domain. This morning, are you ready to respond to the Lord? Are you ready to stop being idle? Are you ready to enter into the harvest? Are you ready to come and follow Jesus? Friends, it's all about us recognizing how beautiful it is to come and stand within His presence. A reference to the article that you have today. From the song, there's no greater blessing than to be in the presence of of Jesus. To accept the fact that only He can save. So with this parable we learn about those in the kingdom of heaven and the unforgiving or the unmerciful servant an unforgiving spirit is not acceptable. In this parable the laborers in the, in the vineyard we learn that there's no room in the kingdom of heaven for those who are either mercenary or commercial in their thinking. I want something if I come and do this and want it on your terms. Jesus has promised, I will give you rest. Isn't that enough? Come to me, he says. All of you that are tired and worn out and weary, that's the word he uses, weary. Those of you who are weary laden, I will give you rest. Jesus is the giver of the gift and he will be uh, fulfilling in all that he has promised because it's his to give for those who come and stand with him forevermore. This morning, are you subject to the invitation to stop being idle? Are you ready to come into the harvest? I got a little loud a couple of times. I hope I didn't start it yet. I'm aiming at your heart. I'm not aiming at your feet. I want us all to realize Jesus is calling us. The song says softly and tenderly, but if we could just open our ears, he is screaming across eternity and time. Come, follow me. What will you do with Jesus? As together we stand and sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. Seeing the portals, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home. Why should we linger and heed not his 
mercies, mercies for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is coming, coming, O sinner, come home. Today is Family Sunday, and so we invite everyone to join us for a fellowship meal immediately following uh, the prayer. Uh, so there's going to be no evening service, no last leaders tonight, uh, but there will be a card making class for the ladies given by Lynn Coates after lunch. Also, remember if you sign up for the golf outing uh, arranged by Scott Wyckoff, that's this afternoon also. Um, ask you to remember all those on our prayer list and there's a couple of updates we need prayer for uh, janet jones she was diagnosed with an abdominal aneurysm and she's waiting uh, to see her uh, vascular surgeon about that and thelma miller is traveling back from tennessee uh, to address serious health issues so please pray for her and uh, she has a safe trip back uh, we have a few sign-up lists in the foyer. Uh, the men's barbecue and devotional night is November 5th. And Ladies' Day in Tuscaloosa is also November 5th from 11.30 to 1.30. And Wanda Galloway is a speaker. Uh, you know, we're keeping track of the storm uh, as it heads this way. So please watch on Facebook. We'll let you know about Wednesday if there's going to be a meal that night, uh, ladies Bible class and evening uh, services here. And next month is Pantry Packer Month. Uh, there are shopping lists in the foyer with the most needed items. So if you could start bringing those items uh, uh, next Sunday so we can pack and be Nick, Nick next month we'll pack him out of the pulpit. That's all I have. If you could please stand and join me for a closing prayer, and I'll be praying for the food also. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with this day that we can honor you and glorify you as your forever family. We thank you, Lord, for sustaining us and sustaining your creation. Father, we pray that you would be with those that are in the path of this hurricane. We pray for their protection and safety. We ask that you would strengthen our faith, Lord, strengthen us spiritually through the challenges we face in this life. That we would always remember that you were in control. Lord, pray that we would always focus on you, focus on your word and, and what is good and what is pure. We just thank you, Father, for Jesus, for him saving us to eternal life. 
We humbly ask that you would forgive us when we stumble and when we fall. We're thankful for the food that's been prepared for today. We pray that you would bless it to our bodies. Please bless our fellowship. And we ask your help that we would be constantly on alert for opportunities to share the gospel. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.